Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Huda Wahba. I'm here on behalf of Ain Shams University. I would like to thank the team from uh, RRK company, and they are our partners in uh, delivering the course for the US LMLE. And uh, we'll be happy to, um, to hear from them uh, an introductory, uh, introductory um, presentations on what they're offering and the benefits that you'll be getting from this course, um, the opportunities that you have at the US. And at the same time, we're going to have um, a session in the end if you have any more questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani, and for your team and for uh, the collaboration. And the floor is with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ola, can you begin, please, the introduction? Yeah, Dr. Hani. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this session with us today. First, I would like to uh, welcome you all. Uh, we are very glad and honored to be uh, with you today in uh, this orientation session. First, we were, uh, will start with the opening speech with uh, Dr. Hany Ayesh. He is the owner and CEO of RRK uh, Worldwide LLC, and he is a sit assistant dean of uh, one of the biggest universities in uh, the US. Dr. Hany, can I start? Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Gamian. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us to attend this meeting. I want to speak Arabic because I know that a lot of the students now speak Arabic. I will try to make it mixed and uh, we will feel free to talk Arabic or English because I can I cannot see some uh, any students uh, can cannot understand Arabic, but it, please, as you know, if you want to speak English, please raise your hand and we will change all the settings to uh, Arabic. Uh, first of all, I'm honored to be the, the president of this company. Uh, the, this company is a training company established in 2019. And uh, we, are, uh, we are doing many services, comprehensive USMLE services, including uh, USMLE, step one, two, and three. And we have also a service for research, which is uh, very important. I think we have deficiency in some areas in Egypt in research. And also we, we, will, uh, we will also um, provide the elective, uh, which will be in person or virtual. So um, this comprehensive service will make will take the students from his country to US directly. If he have good USMLE scores, he has research and recommendation letters, and he has recommendation letters also from clinical uh, attachment with in, in US experience, I think this is the best thing he can do because, uh, and also we'll follow up, we'll mentor all our students during the journey from their country to US, what we call path to US. So first of all, uh, I want to introduce my professor, Dr. Mohammed Lerbani. He will talk to you today about the USMLE process in US. Dr. Mohammed, please, can you introduce yourself? And then you can go to, to tell uh, to talk about your talk. Thank you, Dr. Hani. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi My name is uh, Mohammed Lerbani. I am a former professor of anesthesiology at the, the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, currently, I'm in private practice. I have my own anesthesia group. I uh, was very much involved in uh, medical education and research along the years of my academic performance. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm glad to join the RRK in order to open some opportunities for medical students who want to pursue their medical career in the US. Uh, and I tell them, you are not alone. More than 100,000 medical students and residents sat for you as one of the US families tips last year. So you are not alone in this path. Um, and our RK is here to help you uh, start your journey. Uh, your journey will start by taking the USMLE. It's the United States Medical Licensing Examination uh, for intermediate, um, for international medical graduates and people who are still students in accredited medical schools in the US and medical schools who that are written in the, in the word directly of medical schools are always welcome to go through the US MLE if they want to pursue their career in the US. And, uh, and uh, let me tell you that after, after, when you get this examination done, you will be applying for residency 
And the, the, the match result in the last year shows that 57% uh, uh, of international medical graduates match to their desired position. So there's a big chance once you clear those steps that you get accepted here into a residency program. Um, the United States Medical Licensing Examination is an examination to assess the, the knowledge, the medical knowledge, whether in basic sciences or clinical sciences, in order to make sure that you are ready to start your medical training here and to start dealing with patients in a supervised manner. In order to deal with patients and treat patients in, a, in an unsupervised matter, you will have to take step three. But let's focus first on step one and step two um, uh, in order to get you get a residency here in the United States. Uh, you go through what we call here an educational committee for foreign medical graduates. This was established in 1956 and it gets you a certificate. Once you pass those steps, this certificate is considered like a, the National Board of Medical Examiner's certificate for US and Canadian medical students. So you are equal to those and the chances to get a residency in the United States. Uh, you have to go to step one. Step one is uh, assesses your medical knowledge in the basic sciences, the foundation of, of the clinical uh, applications. And, and those will include, uh, of course, physiology, pharmacology, uh, anatomy, histology, biochemistry, uh, pathology, microbiology, immunology, and the add to add behavioral sciences, aging, nutrition, and biostatistics. Uh, those are the topics that you will be examined for. Most of those topics you take in your uh, home country and, ho and home medical school, uh, but they need sometimes to be polished, they need to be reviewed, and you, you need to be well prepared to the nature of the course here because the examination of the uh, examination here because the examination here is a little different than uh, uh, those we you, you might have back home wherever you are. Uh, usually US medical students take this test by the end of their second year and they take step two which is clinical knowledge by the end of their third year of being medical students here in the US. Uh, the examination is a one day examination for step one. It's an eight hour examination, seven blocks. Each block is 60 minutes and you get 40 questions in each block. The total of questions you are getting will be 280 questions in that single day examination. You have 60 minutes from 45 to 60 minutes of breaks in between if you wanna to go to the bathroom, uh, if you wanna give a quick phone call, if you wanna have a bite or something like that. It's a tough test and you gotta be well prepared. And uh, uh, regarding step two, uh, which comes after, uh, uh, it, it tests your knowledge in the clinical sciences and how you can diagnose and treat patients uh, in the clinical setting, in the hospital or in the surgical center or in the office or wherever you are. Uh, so it tests you for your uh, knowledge clinically in, um, in internal medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, uh, surgical, different surgical subspecialties, and uh, uh, and uh, usually it, uh, and. Uh, usually some other like psychiatry and, and some other clinical topics. It's, it focuses and centers on patient management. So either step one or step two are usually given in questions, are given in a case scenario. So it starts with 32 year old adult female came to the ER complaining of pain on the, uh, on the pelvis and uh, examination showed, uh, laboratory showed, this with high lactate or high or low pH or whatever, and uh, that your most likely next step will be one, two, three, and, and you choose. It's a multiple choice examination. Uh, uh, 
Uh, step two examination again is a one day examination. It's a little longer, it's, it's nine hours, it's eight blocks. Each block is 16 minutes and you get examined in 40 questions in those 16 minutes block and you have one hour break all through the days from 45 minutes to one hour break throughout this day. Uh, so you end up with 318 questions that day. If you clear both uh, steps, then uh, uh, your chances are high in getting a residency. You can start applying through the array system to your resident, uh, residency in the US. Uh, and as I said, 60, almost 60%, 57% were matched of international medical graduates. It will make you happy also to hear that one of every four practicing physician in the United States is a foreign medical grad. So you guys go ahead. You have a, a promising future waiting ahead of you. I, I'm glad to be one of the faculty members in, in, in RRK that's gonna, that who are gonna help you uh, start at least uh, the journey. Uh, during this course, we are gonna help you uh, understand how to prepare. We're gonna help you uh, uh, locate the real resources. We're going to give you some resources, literature. We're going to give you lectures and with um, uh, uh, like um, emphasis on high yield points, which come usually in the exam. We're going to tell you how to apply and register for all the different steps. And uh, uh, I think in Egypt, usually it is uh, either the exam is either held in um, in the Amid East in Cairo or uh, something similar in Alexandria. There are two sites, Cairo and, and Alexandria. Uh, and you can take it in either, either place. It's the two metric uh, uh, test centers back there. And if you are a medical student in an accepted uh, medical school or you are a medical graduate, then you are eligible to apply for this uh, for this um, examination. So good luck to you all who are gonna help you start the journey and it's um, a wonderful journey. Best of luck to you. I'm glad to talk to you and I'll be seeing you during, during the course. Thank you, Dr. Hani Ayash. And I also uh, uh, congratulate all uh, the faculty that are attending this uh, uh, introductory meeting and uh, looking for more collaboration with you guys in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Dio Hakim. Uh, he's professor of cardiology, Harvard University, USA. He will give us more details about USMLE and uh, US residency. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon in Egypt, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here and see my uh, um, my old professors, my uh, my. Um, uh, fellows and uh, everyone from Egypt. Uh, well, my name is Dea Hakim. I'm originally a graduate from uh, Seoul Canada University. And, uh, I got my uh, PhD in cardiology from University René Descartes in, in Paris. Then I, um, I joined the, um, the US uh, Institute almost uh, 13, 14 years ago, uh, where I worked at uh, Columbia University Medical Center in New York, then Yale University, and, and now I'm um, uh, the cardiology department, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, I'm responsible for the intravascular imaging in interventional cardiology. And uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today and uh, to, to be part of uh, part of this uh, elegant team. Um, actually, uh, our dear professor, Dr. Al-Arbani, gave a very, very um, detailed and nice um, introduction about the, um, the USMLE and the journey um, the pathway of the graduate or the or the students in this um, in this um, system, and as um, as you as you might know, the USMLE is the United States Medical Licensing Exam that will prepare you to, as Dr. Albani said, to to be part of the um, U.S. health system. So the uh, um, as I said always before, we uh, we have to uh, to divide it into three steps. The, the test, the USMLE test, then the matching, then the, uh, the residency program. And I think in the, in the RRK, like we will help you to understand and to deal with this, uh, with this steps. Um, and again, as Dr. Benny said, like we have to, you have to register first in the site of the ECFMG 
so like the first step will be registration in the site. You have to create an account. That's a, uh, I bet many of you might know this uh, this details because it's it's you can find it everywhere in the site of uh, ECFMG and everywhere. But uh, this is just to remind you. Uh, as I said, it's just a general introduction, and then we might take you in a in a specific sessions after in details. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the first step will be to uh, to register. In the, the first step will be to register in the in the uh, uh, in the site of uh, uh, ECFMG to get an account and password. That will be your uh, your account and your uh, your ID number for everything from the beginning of the uh, of the uh, of the procedure till the end. So that's this number is very important. And it will be uh, some lengthy process to um, to confirm your documentation and your registration, and you pay for the uh, you pay for the fees of the exam. And then from this point, once you uh, once you are registered officially in the ECFMG site, at this moment you can register anytime with this ID, and uh, you access your account. Your account will be will will be like the account to uh, to handle everything. To handle the doc the documents, the test results, the I mean the scores, and to pay for your uh, different steps. Uh, each step has a different fees. It's it's changeable, changeable. It can be changed from one year to the other, and the, and so on. Now, as Dr. Benny said, if we have the test is uh, uh, actually step one, step two, and step three. And before the pandemic, step two was two steps: step two CK and step two CS. The CK is the clinical knowledge and the CS was clinical skills, which was an exam to deal with the simulating patients. But now after the pandemic, they uh, changed this with the, um, uh, like a test to like an English language test and the, the way it was um, uh, transferred to, the, to this, uh, this test. And you have to go uh, to after, let, let me return back to the process of the the process of registration after you register, you have to you, to schedule for the exam. You pick a, a schedule window for the exam or a period for the exam, which is usually three months period. And you can extend this period if you're not ready in, uh, with, the, with the fees of extension fees. Or uh, if you're not ready at all and you missed like two extension or you did two extensions, you are not allowed to extend more <clears throat> at this moment you will lose your money. So you have to be sure that, uh, that like to pick a period or a, um, a window um, eligibility um, uh, period at which you will be um, at least uh, um, ready to, to pass the test. Take care of this. This is a very important point. Don't pick a, 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 an eligibility period after three months while uh, you're still uh, not ready. So you need to extend and then you are not ready and then the money, you will lose the money. So it's very important to pick uh, um, uh, an eligibility period that will give you some time to, uh, to prepare. And again, this will be also a help from the company to help you to, uh, to see, to, uh, to uh, I mean, to follow your curve, your learning curve. If you're ready or not, are you 70% ready, 80% ready? What's, what's the possible score you might uh, achieve? So this, that's, um, that's an important point. The second important point will be that your resources, and uh, there are different resources, the, um, uh, the AMBOS, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the lectures, the, um, um, the materials uh, uh, will give you from the company that will help you. And of course, will be the feedback, the questions and the answers during this, uh, this lectures or uh, the, uh, the, the, during the seminars in the, in the course. Uh, it's very. The, the, I will not repeat what uh, what uh, our dear professor say say about the the, the contents of the of the of each step, but the most important is whether it is step one or step two. You have to uh, change your way of thinking. Uh, again, I will repeat this. Um, there is a statistics or a, you know uh, say that and uh, uh, an article say that the USMLE exam is neither reliable nor valid, neither valid nor reliable. It means that the test is unpredicted. Uh, the results are, uh, the score is unpredicted. 
you might have knowledge, but you will fail. You might have uh, not the knowledge you are expecting and you pass. So it's not about only, it's not only about the, the, the knowledge, but also how, to, uh, how, you, how you can use this knowledge to answer the question. And this is what you need help for, actually, especially for someone who um, who had an experience before or who understand the system. They, uh, for example, like as I said that before, it's uh, it's um, uh, here in the in the in the U.S. health system. There is a Medicare Medicaid system. It's a system of medical insurance for people for old people or people who do, who doesn't have resources. So you might have some questions like that. You or not this situation you. Uh, you didn't face in Egypt. Uh, you have, you might have some um, some restrictions in in practice, in the form of questions. Of course, someone have um, has a Jehovah Witness with people refusing blood, blood transfusion. People having some medical legal. Uh, what you're gonna do? How you can break a, 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 a bad news? All those things. What you're gonna do in the, uh, in the, when you are facing a patient with um, with in, uh, uh, terminal illness or with cancer? So it's not only the knowledge. It's not only that you know the, that uh, the treatment of cancer, cancer breast is so and so and so, but like it's important uh, to know how to use this knowledge to pass the test. Because the aim, as I said, this test is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, not neither valid nor reliable, but it's the only way, it's the only way to go in the, uh, in the system, to be, to be licensed and to, uh, to practice. So that's, that's the first point. You know that uh, you need to get the knowledge, the maximum knowledge uh, you, you can, and also how to use this knowledge. Uh, the test is in the form, as Dr. Arbani said, this is the, in the form of uh, a problem. It's a problem-based exam. And so you have to, to be very quick in um, scanning the question, this problem, and to pick the most important point that you will uh, you will focus on or concentrate on to, to to get the best answer in almost in 50 seconds. So you have like for each test, if we if we think that the the block of the of questions is 40 question, so you have uh, in in one hour, so you have between 50 50 second one uh, one minute to 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 scan the test and uh, pick the best answer. Sometimes like. Uh, you, um, you, you, you don't know the answer uh, or you, uh, you are hesitating which one. So also we will work with you to, um, uh, to, uh, to overcome this problem. What, if, you, if you don't know the question, what are the best guess and uh, how, can you, uh, how can you answer the question with the, uh, with, with the success? So they, this is, should be applied for step one and step two with the difference in the uh, in the the, uh, the, uh, the material or the contents of step one and step two. Step one is basic science. Step two is clinical uh, uh, clinical knowledge, and um, and again um, the um, the score is very important. Uh, the more you are answering the questions, the more you do the uh, the uh, the Q banks. The, uh, the more you will get, uh, you will uh, probably you will get a higher score. And um, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the RRK, the, there is a what the, like, I mean, like a big team of, of uh, uh, experienced people who passed the test or who uh, were working with the students before. And the, the most important are, will be like people who are working in the American system and know that how you can approach the question because um, uh, this, is, this is the most important. The most important is how can you pass the um, the test by using the knowledge to uh, to answer the uh, the question? Will help you to overcome these difficulties. The second step will be after after passing the test and getting the score uh, is to to match. To match uh, matching is the um, the transitional step between the test and uh, having um, having a residency. So because like passing the test, it doesn't mean a lot, but uh, using the test to, to match will be the second step. And uh, the matching process is a, is, a, uh, is a difficult process because you have to, uh, you have to go in a competition uh, with the other students, the graduates, and not only, uh, not only students from, uh, from US, but students from all over the world who are applied for the, uh, for the matching. The matching process will depend on, it depends of course, from one program to the other, 
but like uh, the overall criteria will uh, be based on your score in the um, in the um, in the USMLE test and also my recommendation letters very important to for someone to give you a recommendation letters and mainly well I can't I can't take it to the level even of personal recommendations some phone calls or or uh, direct contact with the program director that's a very important step in um, in uh, um, having uh, on, on being getting met the uh, the third step will be or the third important uh, elements for for matching will be uh, if you if you did some research or did some publication that will help you to uh, uh, to um, to submit a powerful um, uh, application and uh, also if you uh, if you did any clinical attachment or cl or elective that uh, that's it means that you have been exposed to the uh, to the um, to the uh, clinical experience in us and um, the company we will help you and in, in, in this so this is this is the second the second step matching matching as i said it's a difficult process but also uh, if you uh, if you you'll be well prepared if you uh, work to get a, a good score and a good recommendation letter and um, uh, and uh, some uh, some research that will uh, that will uh, uh, increase your possibility to uh, to get matched um, and as dr arbani said almost 50% of the of the matched people last year were foreign graduates. It doesn't mean that the American graduates are not uh, are not good. It just means that uh, like it's the, it's the system uh, which is balanced between. between the, uh, between the foreign graduates and the uh, the U.S. graduates. Continue, Dr. Dia. Sorry. Yeah. I guess, Dr. Hoda, you, you muted everyone, including Dr. Dia. Please, can you mute just the audience? Dr. Hoda? Dr. Dia, could you unmute yourself, please? Yeah, I'm sorry. So the, uh, as Dr. Muhammad said, the step step three is an important step, a complementary step to get the um, to 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 get your license. So like um, um, uh, most of the states require the three steps to get the permanent license uh, uh, to to pre to practice. So this is um, this will be during the residency, and um, I return back to the point of matching. After you matched, matching means. Uh, means that you will get a residency. And in US, you can't do uh, most of the specialties without having a general residency. So if you like to do cardiology or if you like to do a GI um, a specialty, you have to do internal medicine first. If you like to do, uh, if you like to do a, a specialized surgery, you have to do general surgery first. It depends, it's different from one program to the other, but in general, internal medicine residency is three years and the, uh, uh, the general surgery uh, usually five years. And then after you can be specialized, you can do a fellowship and this fellowship uh, will be your, your specialty, the specialty uh, you pick. So this is <clears throat> the steps in, um, in sequence like that will be uh, preparation for the USMLE test, passing the test and then um, um, uh, applying for the residency uh, via the ERAS system, uh, which is the system for, uh, for, for application and will inform you about matching. The more you apply, the, the, the more the programs you will apply for, the more the chance to, uh, to get invitations. So uh, then you will get into invitations for interviews in five, six, seven programs. And then you will go for, for this invitation, uh, like for interviews, and then um, hopefully you will get you will get matched. So the, there are in this pathway to to work in U.S. to to practice in U.S. There are three steps. Each of them are um, each of them is like actually is depending on the previous step. So you need to pass the test to get the ECFMG certificate, which is the certificates that uh, it says just you are equal to the to the U.S. graduate, your 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 uh, uh, your MD degree is equal to the uh, to, to the um, to the students from uh, graduated from a U.S. Um, university or valid to have uh, a residency. And then it's going to be the second step will be matching. You'll apply for the 
for the matching process based on your uh, test uh, results in the, uh, the, the previous elements I said. And then the, the third step will be to, uh, uh, to be uh, hopefully to get matched in one of the residency programs and you pass the, the, uh, the residency, then you'll be full licensed after whether you decide to work as a, a, a general uh, practitioner or an internal medicine doctor or general surgery, or you continue doing the, uh, the, the fellowship, which is a specialized program. And in RRK, as Dr. Hani and Dr. Muhammad uh, said, this is that we're gonna be, we will work with you in each of this, of this uh, steps to help you to, uh, uh, and to guide you, hopefully, uh, to reach to the end of this journey. Um, it, the benefits and the, the the benefits, I think, uh, uh, all of you know know the benefits of of, uh, of practicing. If you like to continue in US, uh, if you like to return back to Egypt, if you like to go uh, work somewhere else, I think that will be a very good experience for you. It's it's going to be uh, beneficial for you whether you decided to continue in US or you decided to return back to Egypt or uh, to go to uh, to any other countries, depending depending on your uh, depends on your uh, your uh, your aims and goals. Well, that's uh, that's just a brief description, and I um, I'm sure that we will have more sessions to explain those uh, elements in details. I'll be happy to uh, to answer any question and get any um, um, uh, if anyone has uh, any question, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Jia. Uh, next, we have um, Dr. Yasser Adman. He is a board certified University of Texas, uh, USA. He will tell us about his journey uh, to becoming US uh, physician. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, hello, everybody. It's, a, it's morning here, so uh, good morning to everybody. <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Dia Hakim has really made my job uh, very easy because he has explained extensively uh, a lot of things uh, that I would have presented, but uh, he has really done a great job explaining uh, the whole process. Uh, I'm just gonna briefly talk about myself. I I've been in the American system, uh, health system for the last 18 years. And as Dr. Dia has said, I started with uh, um uh, internal medicine residency and i specialized in uh, pulmonary and critical care medicine um definitely uh, <clears throat> getting into the uh, american health system uh, is a is a process it's a challenge is a different story uh from person to person uh that's why uh, what i tell everybody is uh, everybody has a different uh, uh story uh, there is nothing uh, impossible. I have seen so many different things um, done different ways. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, the 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 better the CV uh, regarding research, hands-on experience would make a, a big difference uh, in uh, uh, getting into the competitive. Uh, as the journey is getting more competitive, to uh, be a part of the system here. Uh, but it is doable and uh, with hard work, I think it uh, uh, could be there. The more research you do, the more hands-on experience, uh, the more presentable your CV is. And uh, I will be happy to answer any specific questions. Um, but uh, as I think Dr. H Hoda has uh, wanted to, I can explain what I've done. Uh, I, I, I honestly started with doing research in critical care medicine in 2004, um, University of Pittsburgh, and it, it was it was just uh, uh, persistence. You have to send people um, emails, check what what programs are available, and and dig your chance your in your own. And I got research it really helped a lot in in getting. Um, into residency and into getting into be part of the system here. Um, um, the other thing, what 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 we can offer an uh, uh, RRK is also uh, giving you the experience the uh, uh, that we've been through, uh, how to uh, 
make it easier getting to match um, and residency, how to uh, understand the system from inside and um, 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 answering any questions that you might have along the, 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 your journey. Uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions uh, from what I know about the system. Uh, as if there any um, anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, so I will stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Um, next, we have uh, Yusuf uh, Tanas. We got uh, who got the highest USMLA step one score in the world of uh, 277. And also, uh, Yomna Isam, also one of the highest scored students. Uh, they will uh, tell you more about how to prepare for your assembly exams. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's first of all, it's great to be here and some are. Uh, my name is Yuna. Um, uh, I'm a fifth year med student at Alexandria University. And uh, today with me, I have Yusuf. Uh, he's a friend of mine. We, we both are fifth year students. And last November, we both sat this USMLE step one exam and uh, two weeks later, Yusuf received his results and he managed to score 277, which is the highest score in the world so far for the USMLE step one, which of course it's like, uh, it's, it was like the best news ever. And today we're here with you because we wanna share like our experience and we wanna correct some misconceptions. So Yusuf, you go ahead. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for the intro. Um... So I'd like to begin with uh, clearing up a, a few common misconceptions among medical students, especially in Egypt. Um, and the most important one being um, passive learning. So, um, or, or using resources that are basically um, passive, uh, passive learning resources like um, reading huge textbooks or just um, going straight to first aid or uh, watching long videos from lecture series like uh, Kaplan or whatever uh, company out there. I, um, we personally think that this, uh, this method of studying is um, inefficient and ineffective considering the fact that the, the focus of the exam and the questions of the exam are, um, are, are based on uh, application of knowledge and critical thinking like Dr. Dia uh, emphasized. And so we'd always recommend starting uh, questions as soon as possible even if your even if your foundation or your base is uh, weak and it's um, not good enough to understand complex questions because uh, the point point of question banks is not only to to get, get a picture of uh, the, the real exam questions but to also learn that's why they have explanations for every um, answer choice so um, we'd recommend that people start with uh, with questions as soon as they can, because um, it's also an active form of learning. And so um, it, it helps when, when you answer questions and, and, and think critically or reason yourself through through the answer choices, it makes things um, stick in more and also uh, also um, makes you get, get a feel of the real exam. And also there are studies out there that have shown um, a positive correlation between the number of questions that you solve and your uh, step one score. So it's not only a personal experience, it's actually um, proven that um, it's the most effective way to study. Um, so yeah, and, and Yumna, um, uh, I, I wanted you to talk about how we how we approached uh, questions and the note-taking part. Uh, what do you think of uh, note-taking and all this stuff? Yeah, so basically, well, I, I want to say that like like every student when we started, unfortunately, we started doing the wrong thing because nobody was there to guide us. And hopefully like this won't happen with any of you because we, we want to like we want you to avoid all the mistakes that we have done. So the first thing that we we, we did when we started solving questions, you're just like, OK, new information, let's take notes. So and that was such a waste of time like it it's a terrible idea and it's very common in here like like yeah. each questions have a notebook right next to you and you keep writing this stuff it it doesn't help like you could do that it will take so much time and it will like make like it won't allow you to solve more questions and at the end of the day yeah, you feel exactly. like 
exactly yeah so 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 yusuf would always go like you know okay let's just read the educational objectives that's enough we don't need to to read anything else so and yeah. and honestly I, yeah at the beginning i was just like no 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 yusuf, that's not, we can't do that we, we have to take our notes and stuff and honestly like m the most of the students i've met they don't go back to their notes because at the end of the day they go like oh we have so many questions we want to do uh, there's no time to review those notes so it do, it like 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 you all say like it's it's concepts repeat so if it's a high yield topic like yeah, you'll okay. see you you'll see this concept many many times so you don't need to worry about writing it down and going back to it again it just it's 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 very very ineffective way to 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 do this uh, exactly so and also it's yeah and also it's it's a it, it ends up becoming a passive form of learning and it takes up time from solving other questions for example if it takes you two hours or three hours to write notes for a, a, a block of 40 questions you could have spent this time solving another 100 uh, questions and actively learning and reasoning through those questions. So it also takes up time for more important stuff. And this is why um, an RRK, there, there will be um, question sessions on a, a weekly basis to teach students how to, how to approach questions and uh, critically think, because of course the questions are, are not exactly um, the same style as we have at our uh, uni or at universities in Egypt in general. Um, and especially uh, especially for step two, the question stems are, are really long. They could sometimes be half a page and uh, you only have, like Dr. Dia mentioned, uh, you only have like a minute and a half for each question. And um, you have like a minute to, to read the entire thing and carefully analyze it. And then another like 30 seconds to, to think of the correct answer. And, uh, so, so yeah, you have to be quick at this, and it needs a lot of uh, practice. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And like Yusuf, uh, one other, one more thing. Uh, like people, people like to do like the same cue band. They like to repeat it over and over again. What do you think about that? Oh yeah, I think um, we we think that this is um, not a good idea. Especially when I hear a lot of people go like, oh, your world is the gold standard. Let me do it two times, three times. I even hear people say four times. So I think this is uh, crazy. Um, it's much better if you're seeing new questions and thinking critically the entire process from the beginning. Because when, you, when you're in the real exam, you're not going to see uh, questions verbatim on the real deal. It's the Yes, the concepts do repeat, but you're going to have to think critically and apply the knowledge that you have into novel clinical scenarios, um, not the questions that you've seen multiple times verbatim. So it's better to get used to answering um, new questions, and th even, even if it's something that you don't know. I mean, we both started with low percentages, but this was actually a good thing when we started um, question banks as soon as possible because it helped us learn how to apply the basic knowledge we have into complex scenarios and uh, that's that's what we needed to get a high score on the real exam yeah and like one last thing um because uh, like i would just want to add that when we started doing questions and focusing on questions and of course we try to like, uh, learn the material and absorb it uh, it's solving the questions that actually progressively increased our, our scores and and that's like that's that's true for for almost every single person so at rrk we we always focus like that our lectures would be very concise very exam oriented and that we'll always but we have a subscription uh, to ambos each student will get once they subscribe to the course so that they could from day one start solving questions and like you have mentioned we would have like weekly uh, question sessions and we, we discuss with the students how to approach the questions and like those are top priority at RRK because those yeah. are the things that allowed us to get the highest possible score that we could get and I just want to say that I always say that like throughout the dedicated use of like would always like try to monitor his score and and you go like oh I scored I started at uh, like starts to 60 or something like that to 65 uh, it dedicated not 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 like so and then at the end he was just like ended up making one mistake and then he was just like he got 279 and mb 30 so and that was like that's like oh yeah so yeah exactly so. so 
so yeah, we're we're glad that we're gonna have those uh, sessions at RK. Hopefully, this is something that um, would benefit uh, students um, uh, as uh, because of uh, personal experience and studies out there has been proven. And I think I think we covered all the uh, important points, Yamna. Right? Yeah, I think, I think that so. sums it up. Yeah. So Thanks, thank you everyone uh, for listening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Yusuf and Yumna. <laughs> thank you, Yusuf and Yumna. Thank you so thank much. You. you did a great job. Thank you. Yusuf and Yumna working with us also. So, uh, and we are proud of them. Uh, all their experience will be in RRK. And we, uh, we are honored to have them. And um, I think they have a very beautiful future with us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hani. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Yusuf and Yumna. <clears throat> now we have uh, Professor Gary Neiman. He's Director of Transitional Critical Care Lab in Upstate University, uh, USA, Department of Surgery. He will uh, talk about the importance of research lab uh, and how to be involved. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, I would like to thank RRK Worldwide for inviting me here to overview the research that I am conducting in my laboratory in Syracuse, New York. Uh, as an introduction, my name is Gary Neiman. I'm a professor of research in the Department of Surgery at Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. And uh, I've been there for 46 years. Uh, I'm the director of a, lar of a translational large animal laboratory uh, and we study the pathophysiology and treatment of the acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, and also multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, MODS or MODS. Uh, I've won major teaching and research awards uh, given out by the State University of New York, of which Upstate Medical University is a member. And last year I won the uh, Forest Bird Lifetime Achievement Award for my work in the field of respiratory physiology. So why is a translational animal lab important to clinical research? Uh, because it really, it simulates all of the uh, components of a patient's disease that we try to study. In our case, we simulate uh, a patient that is developing uh, MODS uh, and ARDS. Uh, therefore, if you have a, a excellent translational animal lab uh, model, uh, any treatment that you find uh, effective in this animal model will quite likely translate to a positive human clinical trial. Uh, currently, our laboratory has three translational models. Uh, the first is a 48-hour sepsis and gut ischemia reperfusion model uh, that develops both uh, MODS mods and ARDS. Uh, as you know, sepsis is a key mechanism that uh, causes ARDS and mods in, uh, in the clinic. Uh, the 48-hour duration mimics the amount of time that it takes for these for the syndromes to develop. Uh, we simulate the ICU in that we use critical care grade mechanical ventilators, fluid resuscitation, antibiotics, and we measure all of the lung function and hemodynamic parameters that you would measure in the ICU, uh, in addition to clinical blood uh, gases and chemistry, such as CBC differential, liver enzymes, coagulation panels, et cetera. So essentially what we have is we have an intensive care unit uh, as a laboratory. Uh, the second model that, uh, that we've developed is a heterogeneous surfactant deactivation uh, ARDS model to study the uh, role of protective mechanical uh, ventilation on both um, normal lung tissue and acutely injured tissue. And why did we develop this model? Uh, it's because, as you know, ARDS causes heterogeneous injury. So you have uh, acutely injured tissue directly adjacent to normal tissue, and you have to find out if your protective ventilation strategy protects just the normal tissue, just the acutely injured tissue, uh, both tissues or neither tissue. And lastly, we have a piglet model uh, in which we deliver by C-section uh, to study neonatal and pediatric ARDS. Uh, the, if we deliver the, uh, the piglets uh, early, uh, prematurely, then we can study infant respiratory distress syndrome. If we deliver the um, piglets at term, we can study pediatric diseases such as meconium aspiration. Uh, so what are the, my current research efforts uh, in the laboratory? Uh, far and away, the, the thing we study most is protective mechanical ventilation for the ARDS patient. Uh, we've developed a, a time-controlled adaptive ventilation strategy called TCAV, TCAV, uh, which is used to set and adjust the airway pressure release ventilation, APRV, mode. And we found it to be highly lung protective. 
Uh, TCAV, the TCAV method is personalized to the patient's lung pathology and adaptive as the patient's lung gets better or worse. We have shown that TCAV rapidly stabilizes the acutely injured lung and then gradually opens it over several hours or days. The TCAV method has been shown to reduce the incidence, morbidity, and mortality associated with ARDS in our translational animal models and in the clinical meta-analysis. Uh, we currently are going to offer a one-day TCAV course uh, covering both the physiologic mechanisms of TCAV and uh, lung and uh, a clinical application uh, of it in the ARDS patient, and this will be offered through RRK Worldwide. Uh, the second uh, project, which uh, we've just become involved with, uh, we're studying a novel chemically modified tetracycline, CMT3, uh, to prevent and treat both ARDS and MODS. CMT3 is a pleiotropic anti-inflammatory drug that our group has modified using nanotechnology to be delivered into the lung via aerosol. Uh, although the, my, our main focus in the lab is research, uh, we have a very active, uh, we are also a very active teaching laboratory. Uh, I take, uh, for, the, for, the, for the last 20 years, I have had surgical residents from our department spend between one and three years in the laboratory. Uh, the surgery rec residents conduct the experiments that I have funded through my NIH and Department of Defense grants with the help of two technicians. Uh, over the years, the residents in the lab have published many papers in high-powered journals, have been presented many abstracts that have won uh, research awards for major, from major uh, international meetings. Uh, in the summer, we also take on two medical students. Uh, many of the medical students have also successfully conducted small uh, studies that I give them, uh, which have resulted in uh, multiple abstracts being presented at major international conferences, and many of these students have won uh, student research awards. Uh, some of the students have actually published uh, their summer work in uh, high-powered medical journals. And lastly, uh, we also take in undergraduate and even high school students. Uh, many of the students uh, just observe the, most of the students just observe the experiments that we're conducting, although several of the students uh, have, uh, uh, have conducted very small studies and have presented abstracts at local and regional conferences. Uh, one of our high school students actually won a $20,000 scholarship to Syracuse University uh, for a study that we mentored. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, please address all inquiries uh, as to uh, um, collaborating with our research group to RRK Worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Gary. Um, you. Now we have uh, Dr. Haney will give you a, an introduction to what our services are and, uh, and who our team is. Thank you very much, Dr. Olea. So, as I told you before, thank you very much. And um, we are honored to be with you here in RRK. We are an American uh, medical education company, as you said, established in 2019, specialized in medical education, training, research, and simulation. Uh, I am honored to be the president of this uh, unit, of this company. I am MD, PhD. I'm assistant dean of one of the medical academic universities in the US. I'm assistant professor also in internal medicine department, surgery, critical care research department, and neurology and cardiovascular perfusion. Um, we have, we are honored we have elegant team, really. Uh, some of them you will see today and some of them they cannot attend, but we have elegant team, including board certified medical doctors, professors, USME holders, and uh, we have students also. Uh, but we have the highest student, uh, we have highest uh, graduate student with the high uh, grades all over the world, which is Yusuf and Yumna. Thank you. Uh, this is our team and many specialities. We have team for teaching. We have two groups for teaching, English teaching and Arabic teaching. Uh, mixed. We have also a research group which our professors in research, this is great ch chance that they are working with us. And we have also Jafar, he's the director of uh, operation manager of the research. We have also um, uh, Prof. Gary Neiman, also he talked about himself. We have uh, Dr. Wiseman, which, who, who will talk to us now about uh, all the American or the English version of this USMD uh, step one, two, three, and also the electors. And we have a lot of uh, other qualified training uh, and uh, educated physicians from 
Egypt and from US. What's you, this is what we call the road to US with RRK. First of all, you know that the US graduate medical education, I will try not to repeat what's said, but as I told as Dr. Dia and Dr. Irbeni and Dr. Yasser and all uh, my our colleagues said that the US graduate or international medical graduates apply to GME position in September and the result in March. They will begin training in July. We have, uh, they will have a GME position, residency training in general specialty lasts from three to five years. Right. But if you want to Im be involved in fellowship, training in subspecialty will take from two to three years after yes, residency. Graduate of US GME are regular right. to sit for the American board specialties and subspecialty, the highest medical degree all over the world. Uh, what the requirement to be resident in US? So the graduation from medical school list, listed in the World Directory of Medical Schools before 2024, 20, uh, or medical school accredited by uh, World Federation for Medical Education, uh, number one. Number two is ACFMG, Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduate Certificate Equivalent US Graduate. You must have USMLE step one, which is not, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's pass or failed after January 26th. So it's a great choice for you now. You will not focus a lot on step one. Step two uh, exam and the OET, which is occupational English test um, language, and then you can take optional step three. Uh, the fellowship, the same, uh, plus uh, finishing residency at US or worldwide. What you assembly step one, as Dr. Uh, as as uh, we said before, it can be taken by medical students of the second year or medical graduate available weekly in all the country worldwide in prometric centers. Scoring is pass or failed. Uh, basic science in clinical format makes it questions. It's seven blocks by 40 questions blocks. It's 280 as our professor, Dr. Muhammad Erpeni said. You similarly too can be taking medical students, same available weekly and score the exam. Score here matter a lot. And you must have clinical science and eight blocks by 40 questions, about 320 questions. OET can be taken anytime, available all the year worldwide, English language exam, but medical, not like IELTS. It will focus on the th four parts, uh, writing, speaking, reading, and listening. The score is, B is required. USMLC, which is optional which only available in US, Prometric, two days exam, first day, six blocks by 38 quid, uh, questions, about 230 questions. And the second block also about 180 questions, plus three, 13 case simulation. Scored exam required to apply for fellowship, not required to apply for residency advantage if you have it. What the cost of the total cost of the uh, of ECFMG certification expenses application, as you said, 150 step one about the application would be 1,155, 1, step two, 155, also OOT about 455, final application 900 total will be 3,850 US dollars. Here, uh, the national residency matching program uh, 20, no, 2019, as Dr. Muhammad said, they, they, up, they, they request for the first year residency position offered about in 2020, it was 34,000. And the 2021, it, went, it, it, will, it was uh, 35,000. Uh, and the IMG, which is International Medical Graduates, were, they, they win about 20, 20, uh, uh, 12,000 from them from 2020 and 13,000 from 2021. And the matching, as Dr. Mohammed said, also 2020, 61 percentage with IMG matched. In 2021, 57, about 57 of IMG matched. This is great, of course, for the international non-citizen students. Here, the US students uh, in 2020, uh, one, so it's about 40 percent didn't match versus 20, 45 percentage from non-US citizens and match it about 59 versus 54. Uh, this is great to be matched. And this is the residency, how much position, uh, how many position it's, it's offered and what the field, all of them. And also the IMG have great percentage of all the residency. This is the foreigner training, a foreign trained physician in US now, as, it, as you said, 2021, 57 percentage. You, you know, now it's, it's a great chance for foreign, 
uh, students to apply for the residency because there is a lot, as Dr. Muhammad said. What the life during residence? If you became a resident, you the most advanced medical training and education all over the world. The salary will be around from three thousand to four thousand US dollar per month after taxes. Human hours about eighty hours per week. Opportunity for teaching, research, and clinical uh, uh, work. What the life after training? Life after training. I think this will all of you. This is your target because you will have board certified the most reputable medical certificate all over the world, three million pathway, as Dr. Diaz said, work in private practice here, which average yearly salary from 200,000 to 700,000 US dollar, work in academia or leave US and work wherever the world and you will have the highest salary all over the world. Or you can apply for the green card because now we need you, we need the country will need you because you have, you are a professional worker now and we need doctors, especially in pandemics in this pandemic, the factor increasing the chance. So what the factor will make you eligible or fit for this matching without waiting all of this time? Number one, year of graduation. If you are younger, it will be good, but we can help you also in RRK to do this. Clinical experience, US and foreign, uh, RRK can help also. USMLE scores are, can help because we have now a program. It's uh, it's integrated program. USMLE one and two. You can you can go to take the test of USMLE step one now, and you can after two weeks you can go to step two. So we will we will save your time because as you know USMLE step one and two there is mixed or there is over uh, lab about sixty to eighty percentage of the science. So this is our job. We'll do it. Research experience, we have a very good uh, history of research in RRK, all our team uh, publishing a lot. Uh, I, I can, we, we have in, in the highest uh, impact factor journal all over the world, like Lancet. We published last year about three papers in Lancet and the, I, and the PMG and a lot of them. And uh, Prof Neiman also, uh, I published with him with the uh, blue book with number one all over the world in uh, critical care and other stuff. So we will involve you in the research in detail. And I think Jaffer and we'll talk about it now. ERAS, electronic residence application service application. I will help you how to do this and to write your personal statement. Letter of recommendation. This is the most important because if you want to letter of recommendation from the American uh, experience, it's very difficult to take it from here yeah, when you are in Egypt. And this is very important to you when you come to US. And this is why there is a lot of professors, a lot of American experienced uh, pro, uh, doctors here in our company, because if you are if, if you are great and you did the achievement, we would, can write the recommendation letter. So, and if you have this one, the, 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 the USMLE in good grades and also research and the recommendation letter and clinical experience in US, so you have all the requirements to go to do the match very easily. And also when you go to the interview, we'll help you also. We have some people will help you to, to, to train you how to go to the interviews. Uh, uh, RRK service, US simply preparation programs, USC clinical experience, and Dr. Wiseman will talk about it now, observation, medical electives, uh, placement and getting letter of recommendation through it. This is very important. Medical research and biostatistic course. We have a very strong biostatistic course. Uh, and also we will involve you in small groups for research. And at the end of these two years with us or 18 months, mostly you will have, if you are interested, you will have two research if you join our research program. Research opportunity and guidance for publication and the ERAS and personal statement editing match interview practice. Our USMLE course about one to two years comprehensive program for the second for the second year medical students experience US university faculty professors residents USMLE holder and the ECFMG certified physician are our instructor. This is very difficult to find all of this brilliant or uh, elegant team in one course, and this is what why we said RRK can help you a lot because it will be comprehensive service through all the aspects. Our USMD course, updated lectures according to the latest USMD curriculum, question solving and practice through our course, subscription to AMPUS, question we have partnership with AMPUS and we, we will give you free basic passage, uh, package during your uh, journey with us. Follow up till the exam day, US clinical experience, letter of recommendation research, all what you want here to apply for the matching. We'll take you from home 
to your matching. This is what we will do, the comprehensive uh, services for you. Mm -hmm. Our extra services is US professors, it's very difficult to find these elegant people in one program. Research opportunity publication, and this, this will be uh, once you finish the course, if you're interested in research and you join our research group, you will, be, you will publish papers with us in international journals. Letter of support from you as professor, Ampus USMLE tools, virtual, virtual and personal elective. Dr. Wiseman will talk about it now. Our partnership, we have training under and postgraduate American societies and university education, research and clinical application with MDs or health professional. And also we have collaboration. We are honored to have collaboration with NCHAMS University, which is uh, one of the uh, largest uh, uh, universities all over the Middle East. And we are honored to have this establishment uh, of this partnership. And um, we are honored to, 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 to give our service to all the people in Egypt, all the people in all over the world, not in Egypt only, all over the world to, to, to work with us or to, to train them to go to their journey and uh, achieve their dreams of becoming a US doctor in you and practice medicine in the US. Thank you very much for your time. And I will uh, thank you, Dr. Awala. You can go to the next step. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Haney. Uh, now we have Dr. Wiseman. He is I am uh, Interim Medicine Board Certified in New Jersey, USA. Uh, he's also the instructor of our English course in our RK. He will tell uh, you more details about our integrated step one and two course, uh, step three course, and our electives. Hello, hello, and, and thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Ayish, for, for um, involving me and you know, um, allowing me to attend today. And thank you, Ain Shams University, for this collaboration and for allowing us to have an opportunity to get our, you know, a little bit know more about our company and kind of what we do here um, at our K Worldwide. Um, I sort of wanted to start off just a quick introduction about myself. Um, I'm from New Jersey, um, born and bred in New Jersey. Um, I did my, all my education here in, in New York City, which is only a few minutes. If you know the geography, only a couple of minutes from New Jersey. Um, I did my undergraduate, I did my medical school um, in New York. Um, and, and then I finished my residency in internal medicine. I'm currently a chief medical resident in one of the largest um, healthcare systems in New Jersey. And what I've been doing is I've been educating medical students through our um, US medical school system for about half a decade now, um, both clinical and basic sciences. And with RRK Worldwide, we offer this very, very unique combination course. And my responsibilities are helping with the step one, step two, and step three, USMLE step one, two, and three um, review courses. So I'll first talk about these courses, and then I'm going to go on to talk a little bit about our externship, our US clinical experience, which is obviously super, super important. So in summary, the, the USMLE step one and step two CK course um, is very, very unique. And I'll start off by saying what we don't do. What we don't do is give long, dry lectures about topics in medicine, surgery, and OBGYN. We don't, we aren't there to teach content in, in, in mass lectures, because as we spoke about before, that is, that is really futile. It's a waste of time. Um, what we do is we review and teach the high yield topics in every single topic that will be in step one, step two, and step three. And then we really aim to do a, a question-based approach. So every single topic we teach in the high yield, we just go through, not, we don't go through questions in the form of questions. I speak out in the lectures and the videos exactly where they will ask you. They'll ask you on this, they'll ask you on this, they'll ask you this way, they'll ask you that way. And we, our aim here is that when you sit down to take the exam, all of these will play back in your head and you'll really get into the mindset of thinking like the exam writer, it's taking the content, and answering the question, getting the question right. We don't care to talk about, um, for example, we're talking about myocardial infarction and I have a PowerPoint um, um, you know, that's gonna be coming up right now and I'll tell you exactly how we're gonna teach this course, but we're not here to talk to you about the pathophysiology and the risk factors and lifestyle modifications. And you could take this topic and listen for a three hour lecture, which is great, it's educational, but that's not how you answer the questions right on the exam. The way you answer the questions right on the exam is going through actually how they will ask you the question and nailing the right answer and saying, okay, these answers are wrong for these reasons. That's, that's the only way to do it. And how do we know this? Because myself and the colleagues who are um, going to be giving these courses, we write questions for 
um, we write content for first aid. We wrote questions for the um, for emboss. We wrote questions for Kaplan. <laughs> so we know we know exactly how this stuff is done. Um, and even though some of us have suggested questions for the actual USMLE, but a lot of that's confidential. We, we can't talk about that, but we know exactly how these questions work and exactly what they're trying to teach you with these questions. So without further ado, I, I really just wanted to start off with a little bit of a sample for, for the audience. Um, I will share my screen and, and teach, show you a little bit of what our, our lecture series is like um, for this United States Medical Licensing M1, 2, and 3. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, and it's short, it's not, I can't go into much detail here. Um, uh, Wala, are you able to see my, my screen here? Yes, yes. We can oh, excellent. Okay. Yes, you can see your screen. Excellent, excellent. So this is an example of a slide. So, you know, uh, this is just from histology. So this is USMLE uh, step one. And what I show is I show a picture here of adipocytes, fat cells. Um, now you look at the slide. So I'm not here to teach all the details about like, this is not a histology course. Here we focus on getting the question right on the exam period. So. We look here, we look at the two pictures and the one question they sometimes they would ask you is they put a picture to this slide here and they said, under what light microscope, under what microscope are you seeing this? Uh, choice A, light microscopy. Choice B, electron microscopy. Choice C, freeze fracture. This is light microscopy. As you can see, this is from a light microscopy. They do the same thing with this picture. What do you, under what microscope are you looking at it? The answer is electron microscopy because it's black and white imaging. This is exactly what we'll teach how to get that question right. Otherwise, you won't know the answer. You can know all the medicine. You won't know the answer to the question. And what the another question they ask on this, they show you a picture of this. They put an arrow here, a big arrow here. These are fat cells. And they say, in what patient would you most likely see this type of cell? So um, choice A, a 29-year-old female with a BMI of 18, a 77-year-old male with a BMI of 31, a 44-year-old male who um, is an avid runner. So they want you to know that you're looking at adipose cells. So it's most likely to be in somebody with a high BMI. You see how they could trip you up easily. So that it's, this is what we call a two prime question. One prime question is when the, the reader, when the test taker just has to know one piece of information. What are you looking at under light microscopy here? Fat cell, that one prime. Two prime is what are you looking at? Now, how do you interpret that into a question? So the second prime is, okay, you're looking at a 77-year-old male with a BMI of 30. He, obviously, he's obese, and he'll have mostly fat cells. So this is just an example of how we would teach this small topic in the histology section to get the question right on the exam. Next slide. You show a picture here. What are you looking at under electron microscopy? So the answer is mitochondria. That's a first prime question. Second prime question, what's the function of this organ? So you don't have the mitochondria. What is the function? So you have to know what the organ is. Okay, it's a mitochondria. What is its function? It produces the energy for the cell. How do you know it's mitochondria? Memorize this picture and look at the multiple nuclei here in the cell with the ridges here, which are pathognomonic for mitochondria. So this is so there's not a whole lot of detail here, but I'm just telling you exactly how you get this question right on the exam. And this question shows up all the time. Um, I want to move on now to like more of like the de developmental milestone by age. And there's just a random topic I pulled from one of my slides. Um, so I go here. Yes, we're teaching some content. We're teaching the high yield topic, but I'm telling you exactly how they're going to ask this question. So these are the developmental milestones. So they want you to know all these months exactly. And this shows up. It might sound silly, but for pediatrics on the step one and step two, this shows up every year, every time, two questions on the exam, between one and three questions. So they, they give you a scenario. Okay, you have a, um, a, a, you know, at the pediatrician, you have a young office, um, you know, a young patient who, um, is, who is standing up he speaks X many words. He has blah, 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 blah. But you, in your head, you say, okay, he's standing up. He must be about 10 months old. You have to memorize that. Standing up, then they ask this all the time. They also ask how many, based on, they tell you the kids uh, uh, stacked six cubes in a row. How old is the child? Okay, so the ratio is age times three. So a two-year-old kid stacks six cubes. Three-year-old kid stacks nine cubes. The answer would be two. And the answer choices are A, one, B, two, C, three, D, four. Answer is two. So what we do is we show you a slide like this and we tell you exactly how they're gonna ask the questions on this information, question-based approach. No other review course does that. They lecture, 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 waste all your time. At the end, you, were, you forgot even what they, what they talked about. You definitely will get the question wrong, even if you listen to an hour and a half lecture. C, this is more of our USMLE step three, but also in step two CK, very clinical. We say, okay, when we're talking about stroke, three types, embolic, thrombotic, hemorrhagic, of course, basics. Here we go, straight to the point. 
You have a 78-year-old male with diabetes. He presents with two hours of right-sided, lower extremity weakness, and a facial droop. What's the next best step in management? Now, we're not talking about the risk factors for stroke. We're not talking about how the present, how the weakness will be. We don't care about that. I mean, it's, a, it's important for academia, read it up. But here, we want you to get the question right. So what's the next best step in management? A, MRI, B, aspirin, C, Plavix, D, C, T, head. So as we all know, and this is more of the basic question, but again, a lot of medical students won't know this. What do you want to do here? You want to rule out a hemorrhagic stroke. Of course, before you start management, rule out a hemorrhagic stroke. Choice D, get a CAT scan of the head. Boom. Next question. CAT scan is negative. Next best step. What do you do? Aspirin, thrombectomy, CTA. Believe it or not, some people say, okay, just start treating. Give them aspirin. No. CTA, rule out large vessel occlusion. You want to rule out a major stroke, which what would you do in this scenario? Why does it matter? Why are you doing more imaging now? Why is the answer CT angio? Because then you can do a thrombectomy and remove um, that clot. Next question. This is all CVA. We're, we just go and go and go until the, it's so clear that any question you get on the topic, you nail it. And that's it. Same scenario. Two hours, right side of weakness, blood pressure, 221, 10, CAT scan negative, CT angio negative. Next best step. What do you do? A lot of people say, okay, he's in the window of TPA. Boom. Let's give him TPA. Wrong. Completely wrong. You have to lower the blood pressure. IV libeta law. So again, we teach how to the blood pressure management. And this is where I'll talk in the video saying, okay, um, 185, 110 is the blood pressure under which one can give TPA. Post TPA, 105, 105, 205, 105. We talk about ischemic stroke management. We, we talk, talk, talk here, but the key is to get it right. IV libeta law, you got to lower it first. You got to lower the blood pressure. Boom, next question. Now you gave the libeta law. Libeta law given, now it's 170, 83. Next step in management. Then you go with the TPA. Okay. We keep going on this topic. This is just another example, and I'll, I'll start wrapping up. He presented a day ago. This is the same patient, but a day later. Repeat CT shows no bleeding at 24 hours. EKG shows atrial fibrillation. Next step in management. And this question shows up all the time. This question, why? They love this question because it really, um, it really separates the students who like know a buzzword and like get a question based on a buzzword or understand medicine and understand how the exam writers want you to answer the question. Most people, what do they say here? Oral anticoagulation. Patient's bleeding, 24 hours, it's stable. EKG is with AFib, you need to control the AFib with anticoagulation. He's 78 diabetes, he meets chad Vas criteria. Boom, oral anticoagulation, completely wrong. And this is, where, this is where the exam writers, they love, they love giving you this and showing you AFib, they love it because they, they, they just weed you right out right there. So what do you wanna do now? What do you wanna do in this situation? So you, can, you can absolutely cannot start AOR anticoagulation. It's contraindicated. According to all the societies, you want to give chemical DVT prophylaxis like Lovenox, heparin, 5,000 milligrams. Why? Because you want to prevent stroke um, in these patients who are high risk. Um, you want to give the chemical DVT. It's safe with 24 hours after CT with no bleeding. It is safe. Why not oral anticoagulation? Look, this is from not me. This is the American Stroke Association with the AHA. You cannot start, and this is in the setting of AFib. You want to wait because there's something called hemorrhagic conversion. You do not want to give it at least four to seven days um, for acute stroke. That's not even talking about TPA, but certainly in the setting of TPA, you must avoid oral anticoagulation. This is just showing you how they trip you up. Um, and um, one more question just um, on this topic. Same patient, very similar patient, comes to the ER, right-sided facial, right-sided weakness, facial droop, resolved 30 minutes ago. All resolved. Next step in management. And you're looking here, what's going on here? Next step in management, I don't know, they're also similar, you know? So we teach you and we say, listen, this patient has what? A, this is a two prime question because you have to know A, he has a TIA. B, how do you treat a TIA? Now the recommendations are saying, no, you don't image, it doesn't matter. And aspirin, no, Plavix, no. So you wanna do the aspirin Plavix for 21 days. This is now the new recommendation. This, and the exams have started to catch up with this new recommendation. So we teach you how to answer questions, get them right. That's what our, our exam does. Okay, that's the end of this little PowerPoint. Um, I will stop sharing this um, screen and go back to talking a little more. You can talk about step three also and the electives. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is this is step one, step two, and step three. Um, and the, the the more of the second half of this was kind of what our step three course. Our step three course, a shorter course, um, and it's very very clinical focused. Um, it, we follow exactly what the USMLE. We break it down by topics that the USMLE tests on, and we have a question. Um, based approach, exactly like this. We teach the content, a high yield content. And I just, we, in the videos, we talk about where they'll ask you the questions and how to get them right. Exactly what we do for step one, two, we do for step three. 
very effective. Our goal is for you to excel on these exams, We're not to waste your time with, with long lectures or many, many topics that don't, um, aren't so relevant, but we want to get the questions right. That's the focus. So that's, that's the first thing um, I want to talk about. Now I wanted to tra uh, transition a little bit into our um, USC, US clinical experience. Now, um, as myself, I, I've interviewed about 500 applicants for our residency program um, in the past two years. Um, and I plan to interview thousands over the coming years. But um, this is just something that we ask every single applicant. Oh, we say, okay, sir, um, make up a name, Abdul. Um, tell me a little bit about some of the experience you had taking care of patients in the United States. And they say, you know, sorry, I, I only took care of patients in Bangladesh, in Egypt, in, in Cairo. So then our next question, unfortunately, you know, um, the healthcare system is very different here. And how do you think you will um, be able to maneuver and navigate through the system in a very tough intern year? And the, the applicant has nothing to say. So this is why we want to emphasize our USE, US clinical experience. We offer all students um, um, to come to the United States for a period of time, whether it's one month, whether it's two months, whether it's three months. Um, and we do is we, we pair you up with a teaching um, faculty member um, who have dedicated to teaching, who will guarantee you a letter of recommendation at the end. And this, this way, it, it serves two purposes. A, it allows you to have a letter of recommendation, which is super important from a US you know, board certified physician. B, it allows you to come to the interview with a little bit of ammunition you're coming to the interview now saying, okay, they ask you the question, tell me a little bit about your US clinical experience. Have you done anything? Yes, yes. I spent two months rotating with X and Y cardiologist um, who's affiliated with X and Y teaching hospital. They say, oh, interesting. What did you learn? So you tell them what you learned. This is how you impress, you know, the, the, and I, I know this because this is how students are impressing me. So this is really what I want to emphasize. So a little bit um, more about this um, experience. What we do is we, um, you, you have the option of doing it in general internal medicine, the outpatient setting. Um, in either my office, one of my colleagues who um, we trust and we, we believe will handle your, you know, will teach you on a day-to-day -day basis. And main focus is to teach you medical education and to, to be there for, you know, for your mentorship and to ask questions. Um, you get to choose if you want to do it in a sub-eye, such as cardiology. Um, you want to do it in oncology, in gastroenterology. You want to do it in endocrinology. We will set you up. Um, whether if you want to do it in obstetrics and gynecology, we'll set you up. So this is sort of what we, we do and the importance of our U.S. Um, clinical um, um, experience. That's really the main thing I want to talk about. If I have another two minutes, uh, Professor Ayesh, I want to talk a little bit about the virtual um, yes. um, experience that we're talking about. You can, you can. Okay, excellent, excellent. And I think, so So with the virtual, um, ro ro um, we call it rotation, but it's really, really virtual education, virtual didactics that we um, are, are setting up and have worked very well. And this is not me coming up with this idea. Medical schools have approached me in the United States saying, hey, um, you know, Dr. Weissman, you've been educating a lot of our um, students. Is there any way you can give them a, a way to brush up? And this is solely for internal medicine. I apologize right now, it's solely for internal medicine. Um, any way for them to brush up on their on their skills before they come for intern year in the hospital. Um, you know, these are third year, fourth year, or I mean, in the U.S. system, in your system, it would be a little bit different. It would be patients, uh, students who are in their clinical phase, um, or moved on from their basic science, but are in their clinical training phase, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in Egypt, whether it's in any country in the world. We offer um, what we call a virtual didactic or rotation. Now, our goal here is to go through the bread and butter cases that you see in hospital, internal medicine. And what we do, um, it, it's a three month uh, a, a rotation, it's a three month program, and it's twice a week, um, we, we have it live. And what we do is we go through all the cases you see in the US hospital system. We start off with the patient presentation. We move on to the differential diagnosis. We make it interactive. What do you think the different the, the uh, diagnosis will be? Then we show the Im we show the imaging, we show the uh, the the lab work. Then we say now based on the lab work, what are you thinking? What stands? What's higher on your list? What's lower on your list? Then we show the imaging, chest X-ray, EKG, echocardiogram, uh, CAT scan, MRI. Now what's your differential? Then we come up. Then we have the uh, most likely differential. We do assessment and plan. So what we do here is we train. It really again it serves two purposes. A for students in, you know, in their medical school training to get stronger in clinical medicine and B, pay, students who wanna do internal medicine before they either do an externship in the US or they match into a program in the US to become very strong in hospital-based medicine in the United States healthcare system with United States 
um, software and how the, 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 the availability of the diagnostics and the imaging, it's very important to understand that imaging um, and lab work is very different here in the States. And we really aim to, to show you how um, this works and, um, and, how, um, and how you would approach a patient like this in a one hour session uh, twice a week for three months. We do a total, again, so it's, uh, if you're looking three weeks, twice a week, um, you're talking about 24 different cases hour-long cases of patients in the hospital or hospital stays summarized um, and how to, um, and you just become much, much stronger in internal medicine and it builds a lot of confidence. Um, it's an excellent resource that part of ROK Worldwide, we, we offer um, everyone. So thank, thank, also, you so thank you, Dr. Wiseman. And also we will provide you a letter of recommendation if you attend virtually. And this is very important also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wiseman. Thank you, Dr. Wiseman. Um, last but uh, not least, we have uh, John Farsha. He is director of uh, research program. Uh, he will uh, tell you more about our research program and our consulting service. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. So right now, just you know, briefly about myself, I'm working with the New York State Department of Health. I'm a, a case investigator. So we're doing big data research with uh, Omicron. I'm also on the editorial board at Biomed Central BMC. Uh, I'm a frequent writer for The Lancet, uh, more than 50 uh, peer-reviewed medical journal publications uh, in less than two years. Um, and I work with regularly with uh, residency applicants, fellows, uh, and medical students um, who are interested in research. So, you know, I wanted to make it, uh, I wanted to show you guys the data. Let me share my screen real quick. Uh, one sec. Yes, so this is the other side because I work with um, program directors and program coordinators. And this is something only you can see with RRK. <laughs> no one else will show you this. So this is what it looks like for the program director side, not the applicant side. So this is how we screen your application. And we see, when you put in, um, we'll see you know, your personal information, your education background, your experiences, which is your CV, your publications, your USMLE scores, and any other limiting factors, which, uh, you know, this could be like if you have anything on your record or anything like that. Um, so I think we, we had a brief introduction on some of the services we offer. Let me go to my PowerPoint. Um, and some of these services, um, you know, include working with your, um, your CV, working on your EROS application, reviewing it, um, letter recommendation services and preparing you and your interview skills and your personal statement. Um, and we have a huge robust program in research that I'll try to speak about briefly. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to show you um, a glimpse of you know, what we hope everyone who's interested in practice in the US they'll receive. And so this is, uh, this is a contract that was just signed uh, yesterday by a resident that I work with. Um, and this is the uh, this is internal medicine program. But I wanted to highlight something about the program, and it's not specific to this program. But all programs are interested in this, and I highlighted it um, in yellow. And this is um, to develop an understanding of ethical, socioeconomic, medical, legal issues affecting care and practice, and participate in the institutional programs and activities. So you know what this means is that programs are interested in applicants who, you know, they can speak comfortably about all of this during interviews. So, you know, this includes, you know, medical issues, ethical issues, socioeconomic, socioeconomic issues. So this is something uh, we prepare applicants with during mock interviews as well. Um, so let me go on to the next slide. So this is a little bit, this is just a sample of, from the NRMP, the National Residency Matching Program data, about number of publications per year. As you can see, the number of publications has constantly been increasing from the number of applicants. So in 2007, you know, if you looked, this is looking specifically at Durham, but you can look at it, it's a similar pattern for all residencies. Um, in 2007, the, the mean, the average number of publications for someone who matched was 5.7, but for someone who didn't match, it was just 3.3. And you can see this orange line is someone who did not match. The blue line is the people who matched. And as you can see year by year, the number of publications is increasing. And this was for US applicants. So typically with international medical graduate applicants, the requirements are a little bit stricter and they like to see even more publications. Um, and this is for a fellowship. This is for 
uh, GI fellowship. And as you can see, for this one particular program, the number of average publications has you know, more than doubled in the last 10 years. Um, so you know, just briefly about the type of research projects typical uh, for medical students. Um, you know, usually when you're starting off, it's very simple to, uh, you know, we'll work with you and develop case reports, which you can present uh, nationally or you can try to publish internationally. But, you know, typically we're seeing that a lot of journals are not interested in case reports because they get flooded by case reports uh, for many medical students. And, you know, sometimes the case reports are just not too interesting. Um, so really where a lot of the students shine is on this cross-sectional studies. You can see about 67% uh, in this particular um, survey, they found medical students' research is usually consists of like cross-sectional studies, and this is simple. Um, this is simple design that we'll try to work with you guys to develop all the way from the first stage of you know, developing protocol to doing the analysis and interpreting. And this is something very easy um, once you get the hang of it and you work with a mentor. Um, and usually, clinical trials. Very few students are doing this. You know, it involves uh, you know a lot of funds usually, I mean, it's very difficult to do you know, randomized controlled trial by a medical student. Um, and also there are um, review articles and retrospective clinical studies. So with retrospective clinical studies like chart reviews, um, these are great as well. Um, if you have IRB um, and sometimes you can work with databases that are exempt from IRB like the SEER database, NHANES database, um, and students can usually do these pretty rapidly. Um, so we work at RRK in, you know, working with your research plan and your research interests. Um, and we'll connect you with a mentor uh, who's a specialist in that field. Um, so this was a study published in BMC Health uh, Services Research, and they looked at career success scale um, for you know, young physicians who are interested in academia. Um, and you know, these were some of the things uh, that they looked at, like conference presentations, publications, collaborations in research projects. Um, and this is all um, this is all part of our integrated research pathway program, and we'll try to involve everyone in our program in small group uh, mentored groups, where we'll teach you, you know, from the very beginning, you know, how to participate actively and build your CV and research career. Um, so, you know, I like to highlight that you know you want to plan your research and scholarly goals very early, um, because the once you know the process goes by very quick and before you know it you're already at the eros application and you have to fill it out you know the research section and you know put all your publications and you know sometimes students are scrambling at the last minute to get publications because it's already time for their application and they didn't plan ahead um so you know this is why we want to start from the very beginning from you know first year students even and teach them so this is not just a one-day thing this is like career in research that we want to establish and that programs are looking for. Um, and for some students, um, they might not be interested in academia. Uh, you know, they want to focus on, uh, you know, just maybe a community health setting or primary care setting. Um, but we cater to all students because even, um, you know, even for primary care, you still need uh, research background because, you know, this is what they're looking for in the ERAS application. Um, and you know, if, if you start early and you keep working on your, you know, your research uh, resume, uh, eventually you can land in top positions. Like I had a friend, uh, Johns Hopkins, just last year, he got, he's starting as a professor at Johns Hopkins. And so I was speaking with him, you know, just before I was speaking with him uh, about the criteria that Johns Hopkins School of Medicine looks for in their professors. So, you know, you don't become a professor overnight. It's a, you know, it's a career, you begin a research career as a medical student and you work on it. Um, and then, you know, just to give you a brief overview, this is from the director of promotions at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And she's outlining, you know, what they look for in their um, professors or their nominees for professorship. And so, you know, they have what's called H index and H index is, you know, how many, how many uh, citations you got for each number of uh, articles. So just to give you an example with Johns Hopkins, the average professor has um, about 68 original articles as first or last author um, and an H index, um, do they have it here, of about 25 and to 23 and about 
20, uh, 2,974 citations. So this is why I said, you know, you want to plan early. And, you know, this is something that's done over the course of several years, you know, throughout medical school, throughout residency, throughout fellowship. Um, you can build your you know, research portfolio, your number of publications, your citations, and your H index. And that's what, you know, we plan to do with RRK and to connect you with experts in the field so you can get letter of recommendation letters so you can apply to prestigious programs as well if that's what your goal is. Um, and, you know, I'm very happy to, to join the team. If you have any questions, you know, you can go to the RRK website and, you know, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Jafar. Thank you, Jafar. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, uh, we are done for today, uh, but uh, if uh, anyone uh, ha has any question. No, I just want to add something by Arabic. Okay. Maybe. Shukra liku kulluku. Ehna netmenna ne ehna nadibluku the best. Andina, ehna zayma fi masal biwuru da. Dayman ili fitmagna fi die empty. And die empty means ان احنا مش عايزين نمشي من الدنيا قبل ما ننقل كل المعلومات اللي في دماغنا لنيو جينيريشنز. And this is our target. Our target I can learn in English and this is our target that we want to transfer all what we have before we die to our next generation. And this is our our aim. Uh, we learned a lot in our life and we want to transfer all what you have to you. So if you are interested to receive and to open your receptors, just to take our his, our experience, we are here. شكرا ليكو كلكو أتمنى ليكو كلكو إن أنتو تبقوا بخير وسعادة وإحنا قلبنا مفتوح وعلينا مفتوح وكلنا إيدينا ممدودة ليكو نساعدكو في أي حاجة أنتو عايزينها in the future. Thank you very much. We hope that we help you in all your career, and we are always beside you, supporting you in all the steps uh, to your journey to go to come to U.S. and practice medicine as a doctor in U.S. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Great. Hani. Thank you, Dr. Wala and the whole team. Um, uh, very informative, and I'm sure uh, most of the queries that I got via mail have been answered uh, during this meeting. I just have one question. Um, a lot of people asked about what is the minimum level of medical education that I need to enroll. And I had one question, what is the maximum age that I can enroll to have a good chance uh, working in the US? So if you could help me with those queries, I can reply back to the, to yes. the student. Yes, we have the minimum requirement will be uh, students in the second year, but we can accept also first year if there is some criteria. But first of all, we will accept the second year students because he has some information about the medical science. So he can, uh, because it's exam oriented, but we'll give, there is a lot of information, informative lectures uh, by uh, American professors or by our professors and here in uh, our, or our instructors. Uh, for the for the other medical students, there is no age limit. There is no age limit. We will help you whatever your age. We will help you to be involved. By the way, um, U.S. is uh, the dream, American dream, <laughs> American dream that you you must have uh, your dream, and we can help you to do it. There is no age limit. Uh, I think uh, a lot of my students, my colleagues, they apply for residency, and they are fifty years old. And uh, and they, some some of them can be accepted, and some of them not. It will decrease the chance, but it's not impossible. We have a lot of people. We have we will help you in all your journey, but we cannot guarantee it, everything. But we will help you with all our best. But there is no age limit. There is no. Thank age you, Doctor Hani, for that. Um, Doctor Wala, do you have any chat questions? I can't see. I guess there are some questions in, in the chat. Uh, someone uh, asks, so the two-year program is for graduates as well, or the time yeah. shorter? Anyone can apply for uh, for our two-year program, uh, either graduate or a medical student. Anyone can apply. It's 18 months. It's 18 months, and we can make it also one year. But it will be condensed for you. But uh, it's 18-month program, and uh, as I told you, there is... We, we can we are very flexible on these programs so we can tailor any program according to the needs of other 
uh, students or other uh, uh, applicants. Hello. Does anyone have any question? Yes, I think Ala has a question. Another question, do lecture have a fixed time? Yes, of course, there will be like a schedule for everything. And there will, there will be both like a live lecture and interactive lecture for question solving and recorded lecture. And you can review later and study later if you want. Get back to them. We also have a question. How can we apply for the research scholarship? Could you please send the, the messages general so both I and Dr. Wala can visualize them for easy communication? Could you answer that question, Dr. Wala, regarding yes. the research scholarship? Thank you. Uh, yes, actually, we will announce uh, the scholarship uh, soon on our website. We are just preparing like uh, the application for it, and we will uh, put the application on the website and Facebook uh, page uh, at the end of this uh, month maximum. We will we we try to help the people to do to in research. So we will we will choose some of our uh, of our applicants uh, for research scholar. Uh, but we we will put some criteria. We are having some criteria, and they must send us their resume. Uh, we will, as I told some some of them yesterday, that we encourage the beginners, and we want to uh, encourage also. The professional we will make some groups between them to make the professional uh, giving his experience to the beginners uh, then they became homogeneous this is what we will do but we will we will announce about this scholarship because um, we need to encourage the people about research in egypt and on all over the world this session for all over the world not for egypt only and i know that you have about 1000 foreigner students in in champs and uh, we will record this vision also and it's recorded and we'll share it with most of uh, the people all over the world to uh, to open uh, the to, to make them apply and to give them the chance to apply for research electives and new assembly also uh, another question how can we join the the course and know uh, its details for like uh, the prices you can uh, send uh, send us an email or you can like fill the application there is application on the website just fill the application and we will reply by email. Or you can go to the NSHAMS. NSHAMS, they have application form also. Yes, of course. You can go to NSHAMS directly to have a. <clears throat> you can apply for NSHAMS and NSHAMS will give you all the details about it. I shared the mail on the chat. So yeah. if you uh, send us a mail, we send you all the material required. Yes. Is it doable to prepare for step one and enroll uh, in research uh, simultaneously? Um, it depends on uh, your application. Either so you are a graduate or you are still a medical student. If you are still a medical student, I guess uh, you have time to do uh, both. Like you, you have time to study for step one and step two, and uh, at the same time prepare for uh, research. Um, if our years of work in the Arabic country, Iraq, for example, counted as experience, uh, of course, it counts. Like um, we ask about uh, the gap or the what what was you doing, what were you doing before uh, applying, after graduation and before applying, and of course uh, your experience in your home country uh, counts in your CV. Uh, if I might, if I might add something, most of the US uh, uh, actually um, uh, programs. Uh, do not do not actually reduce the the time of training based on your prior experience in your home country. Mm. So the residency training will will remain the same, unless there is an a need for somebody in this specialty. Sometimes some specialties make some exemptions, like a year or so. Uh, the other thing is uh, most of the programs ask for U.S. Uh, 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 experience. Of course, they will consider this um, during the interview if you have like an outside experience, because uh, when you become a resident, uh, uh, you will understand what's going on better than the, 
the really fresh ones, but uh, the American system is a little different than the Egyptian system in healthcare management and patient uh, treatments and everything. Uh, so it, it can count towards like, okay, we know some people like it, others don't like it because they say, oh, uh, you see, we are different. So we might have to erase what you have uh, in mind about the practice back there home and then start all over again. So it's it's uh, it's a so so uh, 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 criteria whether you have experience outside or not, uh, and um, I think uh, in my situation I had some experience outside, but I got accepted. So they, it won't it won't be a whole lot of a weight into acceptance versus non-acceptance, but it will give you easier access to the program without reducing the, the time of training. You are on mute, Dr. Mohammed. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to um, tell everyone that uh, if you are experienced in your home country, it's a good thing for you. You will have easier uh, pass during your training here. It won't count a whole lot towards reducing the, the training period. So if you are uh, in anesthesia, for example, uh, there are anesthesia residency is four years. So if you have an outside experience, it won't reduce the, those four years. Um, uh, some people here like people with, outside experience, others do not like people with outside experience. Uh, so it's a so-so it's a situation. Um, in my situation, I got accepted and uh, everything went, went fine with me like a zillion years ago, but uh, um, uh, it won't make a much difference. That, uh, that's what I wanted to say, if you have an outside experience to the program. Uh, and I just wanted to add this point. Of Thank course, Dr. Dr. Mohammed is better than doing nothing, like uh, spend years after graduation with no experience and no, uh, nothing, of course. Uh, hmm. uh, um, this should, uh, you see here, doing nothing is the worst thing. The CV should always be filled and they won't allow anybody, they won't accept anybody who is out of work for two months because they don't know where this person has been. I mean, if you say, if there is a, an interruption in the CV more than two months, he, this person will not get licensed here in the United States. There should be continuous, um, you know, uh, the CV should be continuous. So if you, if you graduate, if you, if you, if you are done with your internship, um, you should join either the university or the ministry of health or something like that. But, you cannot you cannot interrupt it for more than two months. Um, otherwise, the licensing agency in each and every state here won't accept your application. So it should be continuous. You should you should tell them that you were continuously involved in doing some sort of work, whether it is specialized or a general practitioner. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question, please. The registration requires step one, two, and OET, and um, do you mean like registration for uh, the next cycle of match? Um, if, you, if you mean that, like we, we don't know it, like uh, they will announce soon on the ACFMG uh, website, what are the requirements for the next match? Um, another question, step three also required or step two CK. Step three, you can take step three actually in the first uh, year of residency or you can take it uh, just like uh, after step two before applying like it will make your cv stronger it's up to you yes step three though is held in the united states so you got to be physically in the united states uh, and you, you in most of the states you have to be involved in and in started training already so uh, uh, usually you apply for it some years require one year of training, others require two years of training. One or two states do not require any training. Um, 
uh, and you can just sit for step three, but it has to be physically here in the United States. The only the pro metric sites in the United States, uh, you can sit for uh, step three. And after step three, you can uh, work uh, unsupervised. It's, it's a state uh, licensing uh, boards give you this uh, license. But yes. to get into residency, you only need to clear <laughs> step one and two. You, mm. And then you get into, a, you apply uh, for a residency in the United States through the matching program. You, um, lucky, if you are lucky, you get matched by uh, mid-March and then you start July 1st. And, and once you are here and start your uh, training, things will be easy. Yes, of course. Uh, last question, uh, either way to Canada, same to US in preparation and match. Um, I don't have any information about way to Canada, but uh, I, I'm not sure if anyone here can help you. Yeah, I think I can, I can help as uh, it's the different uh, pathway. And I know a lot of uh, my friends have taken uh, <clears throat> exams to uh, join Canada uh, health system, but it's definitely uh, Different, although there is some similarity, but uh, it is definitely a different pathway. Yes. Yes, it's the matching services difference, yeah. Uh, there is another question. What programs uh, that prefer experience back at home? If uh, Dr. Muhammad or Dr. Yasser can answer the best. Uh, what, can, can you, uh, you mean experience uh, in your home country? Yes. Uh, well, well, definitely it, it counts, and, it, and I, I think uh, in the CV, it, it, uh, it really depends. It really depends. So uh, people with, uh, like, for example, I know from my experience with master or PhD back home, definitely it weighs different than doing internship or a year of residency. So it, it really depends on the amount of experience. And uh, 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 what I know is the more skills you have from this experience, the more weight th does it have. Uh, but definitely um, uh, US experience uh, has different weight than what uh, back home experience. Okay, uh, last question someone asks, so I can just not work in medicine after graduation and be devoted to studying step one and two? Uh, to finish as early as uh, possible? Uh, Dr. Yasser or Dr. Muhammad, can you answer this too? Okay. Can you repeat the question again? Sure. Uh, he asked like if he can just not work in medicine after graduation and just devote this time to studying step one and step two. And instead of doing like uh, a residency back home or, or any job, just take one year or two to study. Yeah, for yeah. I got step. it. D definitely he has to have a... Uh, uh, something to justify uh, this gap and, and, and um, for, 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 my, for example, in my situation, I devoted my time to study for USMLE, but I was doing something on the side. There was either a part-time job or some medical experience because uh, having, uh, as Dr. Arbani has mentioned, is uh, having a gap in the CV is definitely a big negative. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, do blab or, or MRCD, uh, I lost the question. Do blab or, or MRCD or the UK do anything in the US? I don't think so, but uh, the creator, if you want to add anything to this. Uh, uh, as I said, from my experience, because I have interviewed people in residency and I, I've seen my uh, colleagues uh, been through this, uh, d definitely the, the, the skills they have would have some weight in the ex as experience, but it doesn't really be equivalent to US experience, but it, it counts in the CV uh, with, comparing to somebody with zero, no experience at all. So it, it will have some weight, but not uh, as equal as US experience, but um, definitely they will look at the CV differently when you apply uh, for residency. Yes, but the, the uh, people from outside the United States will have to have the USMLE done 
whether they are UK citizens, whether they are from China, from India, from Sweden, from Africa, from anywhere outside the borders of US and Canada, they will have to do USMLA step one, two, mm. and three. And that's why we are here. Number two, uh, even if they are licensed in any other country, UK or uh, let it be Germany, I have had some residents actually coming from the UK, they were established physician back there and they have their own practices. They came and started all over again. Uh, so it's, it's a little different situation and they don't want to make any difference between different nationalities regarding the system. Um, uh, so again, as, uh, uh, as we always say, outside experience is good because the, you, they know you have skills and uh, uh, your residency will be fast track, but not shortened in time. But uh, again, you will have to pass through the US system, regardless of where you are coming from, regardless of your background experience, you have to go through the US system. Um, and uh, it's sort of fair for everybody. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, I think if I had a Chinese, I don't want to mention uh, nationalities, but I had uh, one re Asian resident who actually was an echocardiologist back home. And she came, she started as a researcher and she started residency at the age of 53. So again, this answers the question of age limit. Mm. Uh, and she was very good. She was in the OR like 6 a.m. every day. She goes home 6 p.m. or after that. She was very active and she got done. We didn't reduce the number of years, but she got it done somehow. So there's no age limit. There's no difference between different experiences outside the U.S. And everybody goes through the U.S. system. Yes. Iras do doesn't recognize exam besides USMLA. Uh, this is our message to you. You have a great experience as uh, as our colleagues told you, but Iras doesn't uh, recognize exams besides USMLA. So it will give you weight, but as our professor said, uh, but it will not, you must do USMLA. Yes, I guess we are done for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hoda. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we hope to, to do our best to help you in your journey, as we said. Shukran. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. You too.